What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here from Datadash and today is July 12th of 2023. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video, I wanna spend some time to go big picture on Bitcoin. I wanna spend some time to step back on the longer term timeframes and look through a whole range of metrics we usually don't cover here on the channel to try to ask an important question that is on the minds of everyone. Are we really on the cusp of a new bull market? I wanna get really serious about this and try to dive into some important metrics because from history, we know the kind of elements that set up the environment for Bitcoin to continue expanding and become the leading asset across the vast majority of asset classes. So I wanna go ahead and dive into those metrics and try to break them down to see whether or not we can find an answer to our question. Outside of this as well, we've also got a sponsored interview with Meld, which is a company and also a blockchain in the crypto space that's aiming to break down a lot of the barriers that prevented this space from growing over the past couple years and reach a whole new range of cryptocurrency participants. So stay tuned for that. You guys won't want to miss it. And if you happen to enjoy this video, consider dropping a like. It's one of the greatest ways you can support the channel. So let's go ahead and kick off the rambling. All right. I want to go ahead and start off big picture here, guys. We've got the quarterly uh, long-term logarithmic chart here for Bitcoin going all the way back from its inception since it started trading in October 2009 all the way here to where we are in July of 2023. As we can see, as time progresses, Bitcoin has been continuing to maintain this descending, or excuse me, ascending kind of parabolic channel on the logarithmic scale. Essentially speaking, we've been able to maintain really solid returns here for Bitcoin. If we were to put it on the regular chart, you'd see that with every bull market, we get this major whipsaw to the upside. But the logarithmic chart brings us back to grounding, essentially understanding that while Bitcoin has continued to be the leading asset over the last decade, especially over the secular bull run over the last decade, decade from 2008 onward towards 2020 to 2021, we have seen those returns diminishing over time, generally speaking. And this just makes sense. Before we even get into talking about some of the items we need to digest, such as liquidity, such as the halving event, all of these things that people are generally talking about, before we even discuss those line items, we need to understand fundamentally that whether you're bullish or bearish, Bitcoin's not going to return as much as it has in the past in the vast majority of future bull markets. And the reason why is because as an asset expands, it just simply can't expand at the same rate that it used to. Going from practically no value to a $100 million asset or billion dollar asset is much easier than doing the same exact multiple. So just as a kind of rough calculation, going from $100 million to a billion is much simpler than going from a billion to 10 billion. And as you continue down that expansion of a 10X valuation multiple, it gets more and more difficult to do that. You need much more liquidity, you need much more adoption. It's just more difficult to scale. And we can see that playing throughout history here. The annualized returns much more frequently would sometimes have five digit percentage returns, or in this case, commonly back during the early first couple of years of Bitcoin, we saw some returns such as 1,474% and 5,372% in an annual year. Not bad if you can get it. And we can also see here as well that after the first major bear market for Bitcoin from 2014 to 2015, we entered into a new epoch where essentially we saw returns that were much more moderate, but still providing great returns with 2017 providing that blow off top to the cycle of 1300%, not bad. And we can see again that while more moderate returns played out in the next epoch after the last bear market in 2018, we still had a year here in 2020 where we saw a 304% return. Now, as we're taking a look here at 2023, many people are looking at the 86% move that we've had in Bitcoin's price since the start of this year and are starting to think that we're in a new epoch, that we're entering into this era where it's just gonna be sunshine and rainbows, that Bitcoin is gonna continue eventually in this period of time to break to new all-time highs and that we're back towards the old trend. And I think that, to be honest, I can understand a lot of people's sentiment around this. If you're just looking at price, it can feel that way. It can feel like, man, it's really starting to become the new cycle to a lot of extent. But I wanna go ahead and spend some time to break down why Bitcoin did what it did over this period of time, not just because it was a new asset. That is definitely something that played to its advantage. A new kid on the block that has some skin in the game, that has some serious substance behind it, and I do think Bitcoin has substance behind it, a programmatical, 
fixed currency with a fixed supply that is non-censorable, that is open for anyone to access it through their mobile phone or computer, that's a pretty cool system. That's a system that could definitely challenge gold in the long term. But I wanna make the case here that this currency, or this asset, only really expands when it has certain elements playing to its favor. That essentially makes sure that there is more demand than supply. If we're talking solely about price, if we put aside our idealistic ideas about what Bitcoin could be worth because of us agreeing with the features that it offers, right? putting all that aside, we need to understand that the price of any asset, whether it's Apple stock, whether it's Tesla stock, whether it's gold or silver, whether it's the value of practically anything, including Bitcoin, is deterministic on whether or not there are more people eager to buy or eager to sell. And if we know the answer to that question over a given period of time, we are going to know whether or not price is going to generally move up or lower. We can start to build a good thesis around our investment strategy. And that's the question that I've not been seeing a lot of people asking right now. The unfortunate lag right now that the market has had is essentially asking this important question. There have been a bunch of narratives that have been crowding the market here during this period of time uh, since the start of the year that has really gotten people really excited. De-dollarization through BRICS, um, the Bitcoin bank run, and all, of course as well, the BlackRock Bitcoin ETF. All these narratives have gotten people really riled up and whether or not a lot of them have held up, people are obviously pointing their attention to them. And to be honest, narratives can carry for some time, even if they don't have much weight to them. So we need to be very cautious if you're in the camp of looking to answer the big question, not of whether or not we're in a temporary relief rally, but a long-term acceleration. That's the question we need to ask. So I wanna go ahead and start thinking a big picture here, right? First off, we need to understand that Bitcoin at its current valuations is right under a $600 billion market cap. So if we're talking about a thesis of a 100% return from here on out, we need Bitcoin to go to its a $1.2 trillion market cap, i.e. we need to get it back up to where it was back in November of 2021. Now, some people would say that a 100% move in Bitcoin, historically speaking, uh, you know, from this point on, even if you consider the first prior 100% move, right? 200% move for Bitcoin, you know, generally speaking, historically, is still quite minute. And again, just getting back to those new all-time highs, it's relatively weak performance for Bitcoin, right? So again, I want to make the case very clear here, which is that you know these are not the typical kind of exponential returns that many people are being sold on. Many people are being sold on the idea that we're going to a $10 trillion market, can we go to $100 trillion, whatever. Again. Take a look at this here and understand that we need to make leaps and bounds in market valuation in order to reach those kind of percentage returns. So if you're expecting that we're going to get those kind of returns like in the past, I would say think again. If the new bull market is really playing out now, this is going to take multiple years in order to not only clear through this range, but go on to set new all-time highs. It is going to take a much longer period of time than people think, and don't be surprised if there are some heavy corrections along the way like we've seen throughout history. That's point number one, but I want to go ahead and dive into something that I think a lot of people are not focusing on. We first got to talk about liquidity. Now, we've obviously on this channel talked a lot about the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, and that is an important part of the equation. It's probably the most important balance sheet you can watch because it does play a huge range of significance in determining Bitcoin's price expansion. But I've heard a lot of people say, Nick, you focus too much on the U.S., talk about global liquidity. Now, if you haven't heard yet, they're across a lot of different channels on Twitter and YouTube. People have started to talk about this topic of global liquidity, that we can't just look at the Fed's balance sheet. And I couldn't agree more. I think it's a valuable thing to analyze. We do analyze here, while we don't always talk about it here on the channel, I generally am analyzing the Bank of Japan. I'm watching the People's Bank of China. I'm watching the Bank of England, the ECB as well, the European Central Bank. I'm trying to measure all of those liquidity metrics myself. But the big thing here that has really started to garner a lot of people's attention is a new custom metric that is starting to get shared around, which takes a look at the general account, the treasury, it's taking a look at the Fed balance sheets, taking a look at all the global central bank balance sheets and all the potential ways where central banks can inflate or create liquidity in the system. 
And this has been really, I think, a gem of a metric here because it allows us to really kind of cut out the noise, uh, get away potentially from a more US-centric viewpoint and understand that if you measure all liquidity in dollar terms, we can get a really good measurement of how much liquidity is in the system. So this is a really cool chart. I wanna zoom out so you guys can see this here. And this takes us all the way back since 2007. We can see that even with the contraction here, uh, the money supply has pretty much expanded 5X from this point, from around $5 trillion in liquidity back in June of 2007, here towards where we are in July of 2023 at nearly $25 trillion, a 5X in the money supply. This was the core reason over the last decade we saw a rapid expansion in asset prices. Not to mention when you consider that the peak here was nearly $30 trillion in base money supply. That's a huge expansion, a 6x in the money supply from those levels. So when we consider this monetary expansion, it's no surprise why Bitcoin saw the kind of returns that it did. In fact, to give a better perspective here, we can start to see if we put Bitcoin laid over here on top of global money supply, especially as Bitcoin enters into its maturing stages when Bitcoin starts having liquid markets uh, and much more professional traders entering into the space and much more market capitalization way behind it, we can start to see the growing importance of liquidity in determining Bitcoin's price. So once we not only see here, like the white line here is that global liquidity metric we have in our chart, but we can also see Bitcoin's price accelerating during this period of time. However, take a look here. When global liquidity starts to slow, how Bitcoin is more likely to enter into contractionary or stagnant periods. As we can see here, global liquidity growth started to kind of slow versus the initial stages here in the early part of the 2010s. And as we see that, we see Bitcoin's first bear market. But another thing as well, it gets even more clear here as we start to expand global money supply from 2015 to 2018, entering into the later phases of quantitative easing that we saw during this last decade. Look at the similarity, the striking similarity of Bitcoin's price performance. And when that global liquidity contracts, when the Fed started to engage in its first wave of quantitative tightening that it was sticking to pretty consistently before the pandemic, Look at how Bitcoin was not able to get towards new highs. Only when we saw a rapid acceleration of liquidity did Bitcoin come up and reach new all-time highs around 65K. Wow. I mean, it's as if you have this cheat book that allows you to know when new bull markets and bear markets are going to form. If you know when global liquidity is going to slow, that it's probably time to step back and wait for lower prices on Bitcoin, it's a great dip on kind of gauge to know when it's time to get risk on. And also when we start to see global liquidity expanding, as we talked about back in 2020, we were beating like a dead horse. We were talking about the pandemic that was coming. We were tracking the data around COVID at the time. We were like, guys, it's time to get long Bitcoin, right? We were screaming to the roof uh, more than we ever had and stuff since back in 2017 when we started the channel. And boy, was it time to get long. Well, things have changed here. Since back during this period of time where Bitcoin is topping out and notice how it starts chopping sideways right when global liquidity is starting to flatline, when we started to decline, Bitcoin's price fell with it. Now, something very interesting has been happening here. There's various ways to look at it, but essentially speaking, we are down towards the relative lows we formulated in liquidity since back in September. Bitcoin, on the other hand, has started to expand. And we've seen this not just in Bitcoin, we're seeing it in equities as well. And a lot of people generally talk about this as a divergence, a separation between the underlying factor of liquidity and Bitcoin's price. And it is important to note that there can be divergences. If we take a look throughout history, right, I'm sure you can go back on Bitcoin and see clear divergences where Bitcoin maybe did something in the short term. I think here, for example, we had a ramp up in uh, January of 2019 up towards here in June of 2019 with no monetary expansion. So essentially, if you want to kind of view it this way, you have these kind of expansions or divergences between these two metrics. This can happen. It can allow for short-term moves or divergences to play out. But we need to understand fundamentally that as Bitcoin grows, liquidity is an ever-growing important metric. And I want to again draw your attention here towards the fact that while this has been a near 100% move in valuation off of the absolute lows, and I know some people think that that's a huge deal, 
If you invested in crypto markets, you know that this is a relatively weak recovery. This is the bear market bottom, right? If that's the argument. That is a third of what we saw back in 2019. That is a more important metric to focus on because we know if this is a new bull market, I don't care about missing a 50, 100% move. I care about capitalizing on the multiple hundreds of percentages that I can make over the next two to three years. That's what I care about, right? And if you guys are focused on those short-term moves, if you're trading too much in the short term, you're gonna get short-sighted, right? At the end of the day, you will make much better money focusing on long-term timeframes. I know a lot of people are telling you to leverage trade, day trade, chase every single return you can make, and using inflation as an argument to why you should be taking excessive risk. Folks, at the end of the day, if you're speculating in the short term, you're gonna get chopped up more than anything else. I'm just here to share that with you guys. I don't get any money from that. I don't make any money from my leverage trading referral links, right? I'm just telling you at the end of the day, statistical probability tells you that you are gonna make more money focusing on the long term. If you're getting choked up about a 100% move here, which is much weaker than in the past, and ignoring the fact that global liquidity is not expanding when many people are thinking that it's going to, I think that's a bit short-sighted to be completely honest. And I understand guys, right? We took advantage of the August relief rally. Our altcoin positions, we sold at a much higher rate than the current valuations in the market, about 50% higher than where they are now. Bitcoin has gone above where we sold it at around 25K. I'll go ahead and say that, right? We're about 5K premium at around $30,000 for Bitcoin. Putting that aside though, if we do not see global liquidity expanding here, this divergence will correct eventually. I don't know when it's gonna happen, be this month could be the next quarter could be within about a year sure but i gotta tell you guys i think there's a reason bitcoin has not been expanding past this range why the market is not buying right at least it, according to price here for the past couple months that we've got the guts to continue on towards a new bull market that we've got the weight behind us to really drive a new cycle and when i take a look at this global liquidity guys it's not looking pretty if we snap through this range and don't show this as a double bottom for global liquidity or monetary policy can expand, we are in for a whole pain of trouble. If inflation comes raging back and the Fed and other central banks have to continue contracting liquidity, that's gonna spell bad news. And the Fed right now, even though I know a lot of people are gonna be excited and psyched for the inflation numbers that should be still ticking down according to estimates, the Fed is still tightening rates. They are still continuing to contract the balance sheet and many other central banks are likely gonna be in the same position in order to keep their currency relatively stable against the dollar or to basically rein in inflation. Now, this here is probably one of the greatest metrics you guys can keep. And I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna do you guys a favor here. I'll leave it linked down below in the description. Um, you know, basically if you guys want to get access to this metric so you can track it yourself. Uh, but outside of that as well, we've also got another metric we need to track. And that is the halving event. Now, I know a lot of people are saying, Nick, the halving event is in 278 days. And this is going to knock down the inflation rate for Bitcoin in half. Isn't this going to spark a new bull market? Isn't this enough to get people optimistic? Guys, I got to tell you something here, which is that the inflation rate for Bitcoin is becoming a smaller and smaller part of the equation towards answering our question from earlier. As we talked about, in order to answer whether or not we're going to have a new bull market or bear market, or sorry, a new bull market or continue our bear market, right? Generally speaking, we need to ask the question if there's going to be more buyers or more sellers. Miners are seen as a sell side pressure on Bitcoin. This is why the halving of it is seen as this favorable thing because the inflation rate is getting cut in half. That means there's less mining sell side pressure that could hit the market. And that's true. The halving of it will never be a negative thing for Bitcoin fundamentally on this question. That being said, asking whether or not it's you know basically going to be able to support a new bull market, that's another question we need to ask because the inflation rate right now for Bitcoin on an annualized basis is around 1.7% at current rates. So generally speaking, every year we're seeing a 1.7% expansion in the Bitcoin supply. Some of that is held, some of it is sold. But generally speaking, let's just say that all of it was sold. Let's play the worst case scenario here, right? That means all we need in order to maintain the Bitcoin's price, roughly speaking, is that there is generally a 2%, given 2%, 2.5%, imbalance of buyers versus sellers. So 2.5% people more willing to buy positions than those who are willing to sell. 
And because if you can do that, generally speaking, there is more market order flow buy side pressure than market order flow sell side pressure, a cumulative volume delta, more fancy term for it. But generally speaking, Bitcoin doesn't need to do too much from this point on in order for its price to expand, right? And when we go down from here, this is gonna roughly take us from around 1.75 towards less than a percentage in inflation. Now, I know that that sounds great. It sounds like it's getting to the point where, hey, if you don't have some Bitcoin now, you gotta, you, you gotta go out and buy it. You know, you're not gonna be able to mine it anymore. That's already been kind of the case for some time. It's incredibly difficult to mine. But this is generally gonna take us from every 10 minutes, there being 6.25 new Bitcoin being minted to 3.125. And that's an important dynamic to understand because that's really a fractional removal of new Bitcoin issuance every 10 minutes, just three Bitcoin. Now, you multiply that by current prices, and generally speaking, you know, people will be like, hey, Nick, like, you know, that's like $90,000 less in sell side pressure every 10 minutes. Not bad, right? Well, if you go back throughout the past few halving events, we used to go from massive reductions of 50 Bitcoin blocks to 25 Bitcoin blocks. That is where the inflation rate drop is so big. Sure, it's the same in uh, the kind of nominal percentage terms, but generally speaking, we're talking about much major declines. And that's what allowed for Bitcoin to expand. You not only had its most kind of rapid growth rate for demand, but you also had the most increase or the largest decrease in the inflation rate, right? And, and real terms, right? So we can see going from 26% down towards around 13%, coming here from an inflation of 8.5% down towards around 4%. So you can see these huge declines, right? That had much more weight in the grand scheme of things because at that time, that minor sell side pressure made up a huge portion of the existing Bitcoin supply, but it will always diminish over time. This is the, the lie that people are not, uh, that are essentially the people are preaching to you guys. Unfortunately, so many people see the halving event as this guaranteed thing. They've seen the data science models by Plan B and so many other participants. They've seen the logarithmic growth chart and they think that it's just guaranteed to continue playing out. But I wanna close off with one remark here before we dive into this interview with Mel. My argument here is that perhaps it's not gonna be so cut and dry. We are in a period of time where global liquidity is clearly contracting here. It is not showing any signs yet of expansion. And along with that as well, the halving of it is going to have a much weaker effect. Not to mention, it's 278 days out for April 16th of 2024. So when you hear these narratives, when you hear a constant, oh, it just has to do this. You know, it just has to go up. It just has to go up to the right as it always has. Understand that Bitcoin is a relatively new asset and understand that the dynamics that drove its price over the last decade may not be around this time to provide that cushion or support if enough people want to sell and get out of the asset into another high growth asset class or just simply into more protective vehicles if inflation continues to persist. If bond yields continue expanding like they are, it is going to lead a lot of people to question whether or not they want to invest in equities or high risk assets, especially if those treasury yields in the United States get up to six or 7%. And I gotta tell you guys, as I'm looking at the charts here, we can go ahead, pull up the US 20 year yield. It's trending higher here and it's getting relatively close to those relative highs. If you wanted to take small settlement treasuries, right? The one month yield right now, is paying 5.29%. It paid a high relatively recently of 6%. The higher this goes in accordance with the Fed funds rate, the more difficult it's gonna make to have the argument to go long on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Now, I love this space as much as the next guy, but I think if you aren't prepared for this potential scenario, guys, you've gotta get prepared now. Whether you agree or disagree with me fully, it doesn't matter. It's about being prepared and making sure that you've got some cash on the sidelines, that if you are dollar cost averaging, that you're gonna be able to maintain that income flow or those savings on the side, that fiat, to really go in heavy in case we get another wave of capitulation. Because if not, you may be holding a deadweight position off of the hopes and beliefs of the last decade where the circumstances were very different from where they are now. 
And if you guys enjoyed my rambling here today, if you got some value it, consider dropping a like. It's one of the greatest ways you can support the channel. And let's go ahead and talk about another topic here. We're going to be diving into an interview with Meld that is focusing on fixing a whole range of the issues that have limited the space right now. One of them being the on-ramp and off-ramping of liquidity in the crypto space, as well as focusing on one of the core DeFi applications of lending and borrowing, or more specifically, credit creation in the crypto space. This is going to be imperative here. So I really I highly recommend you guys dive into the interview and let's go ahead and kick things off. Alrighty, everyone. So in today's sponsored interview, I'm sitting down with Ken Alling, who is the founder of Meld. I wanted to spend some time with him today to talk a little bit about the vision of what Meld is aiming to build. They're not just aiming to build another layer one blockchain protocol, but an entire ecosystem that's aiming to fix a whole range of user experience problems in the crypto space and hopefully be able to bring traditional neobank fintech application style applications in within the crypto space through its own self custodial wallet as well. So Ken, thank you, man, for making the time. It's a pleasure to have you here i'm really keen to kind of dive into it ask some hard-hitting questions as well to learn more about what you guys are building so thank you for making the time man i really appreciate it super i'm super glad to be here nick and i'm really hoping we can get uh, a lot of really interesting stuff out of this conversation yeah so i know we've got a lot to unpack here in the interview as i've been going through the project over the past couple of weeks but i want to spend some time with you to just kind of get the broad pitch or vision about what you guys are trying to build with meld because this isn't just a blockchain it isn't just some kind of application it's a whole suite of products that interconnect and work with one another well yes there's lots of moving parts but the 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 idea from which all of these parts came out of was quite straightforward. It's the ability for users that that have crypto to be able to unlock some liquidity. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make a lending and borrowing protocol similar to an Aave, um, sort of taking it sort of a next step further um, in regards to how it works but also allowing users to lock up their Ethereum or whatever you know crypto asset they have in a smart contract, in a decentralized, non-custodial way, and then borrow fiat against it. So this is not so much of a, of a kind of a degen play where you can kind of leverage yourself up and do these kinds of activities. You can still do that with the protocol, but that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is for people that have you know big bags, they're long in crypto, but they need some sort of fiat and they don't want to go and sell it because if they sell it, two things happen. One, you lose the potential upside for the asset when it goes, when it appreciates. Mm -hmm. And two, you introduce a tax event, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, you have a capital gains tax or whatever kind of tax you have in your country. So if you borrow against it, then you're able to avoid those two things in the short term and you're able to then get some liquidity out of it. And this type of activity, it's actually the oldest form of banking. It's called Lombard financing. Mm -hmm. That's why you have Lombard Street in a lot of old cities in Europe, because that was the street where all the banks were. They were called Lombard. Um, and this type of financing, this type of instrument exists. And, you know, high net worth individuals and large corporations have access to it. Um, normal people don't. And so we really want to make this available to a broader audience. Yeah. So, and just to explain it earlier, like some of the use cases of this kind of lending, as you mentioned, as you're basically putting up your collateral into the smart contract, uh, you're putting that essentially out there with a certain loan to value ratio where I can borrow stable coins like USDT or USDC. Uh, and from there, I'd be able to use that. I mean, I could use it to fund short-term operations that I just don't have the capital for today. You could use it to go out there, buy more crypto, do whatever, essentially. But there are a couple pretty big use cases here for this lending and borrowing use case within DeFi, where it's probably one of the biggest alongside swapping assets from one to another. It's one of the clearest use cases, as you mentioned, from kind of Aave and Compound. So I'm curious, on that point, I, want, I definitely wanted to hear, Ken, like, how are you guys planning to do that differently and kind of improve on that model? I know one of the big elements is that you guys have improved fiat gateways and other ways where people can kind of move maybe in and out of the system. But I'm curious to hear what are some of the, the kind of things you guys are doing to improve on that? Yeah, so so the, the principal idea was this lending and borrowing going from crypto to fiat. Mm -hmm. But we saw then that no fiat providers were would talk to us. They would either, mm -hmm. it were either too risky or what they were asking for was absorbent uh, margins in regards to sort of going between crypto and fiat. So we had to take the path of getting our own electronic money license. So we're in the process of getting the money license now. We should have it by September. Um, it's just in sort of the bureaucratic process to get approved now. And once we have that, then we'll have an electronic money license to handle fiat. 
And then we have the ability to go between a non-custodial wallet and a traditional fiat bank account. And you'll be able to bounce back and forth between these two. I think this fix is a pretty big issue because I, I, as uh, we talked about before and stuff, I have my own crypto wallet, but the whole idea was making this very wild bet that, you know, you could have things like Compound and Aave in the crypto ecosystem where you could, you know, lock your crypto collateral and be able to borrow stable coins. But the problem was that money just ended up being used for speculation and it circulated within the crypto space. There was nothing ever real about it. I mean, maybe there would be some kind of complicated way, like you go through maybe exchanges and multiple steps to get that money out. But at the end of the day, to be able to have a streamlined way where that money can be realized by a debit card, you know, and you can go spend it. I think that's the kind of transformative stuff that people are wanting to see in the crypto space. So let's yeah, see. I mean, you, you can do it today, right? You can go to Aave and you can take your asset and lock it up and you can get stable coins and take them to, to Coinbase and then be able to go and convert them um, into fiat. But if you do this, you're going to have a very hard time convincing the IRS or the tax authorities that the assets that you're getting there is debt and it's not income. It's not like a taxable event. Yeah. Correct. So you need it needs to be recorded as debt. And so that's part of what we're trying to do with regards to the streamlining of this process is put all of it into a single package so that we're able to document everything and we're able to meet this, you know, uh, regulatory requirements in order to be able to show where it's come from and what it's being used for. The other part of it is, you know, as a lot of people have have seen, if when you're dealing with something in crypto, there's a lot of banks that will, they don't stop crypto, but they have blacklists for crypto exchanges or other types of crypto um, entities, you know, MoonPay and these types of, mm. a lot of them are blacklisted for sending money in and sending money out. And so you get into this very difficult situation where you might be able to do something, but you can't move the money around. And so the idea here is mm. we we meet all of the requirements, KYC and ML on the fiat side. And then once it's in the fiat system, then you can do with it what you would normally do with it. You can send SIPA, you can send SWIFT, you can use your debit card. So really, we're just trying to sort of make this incredibly painful bridge process mm. smooth, predictable, and very cost efficient. So the cost of a swap is a half a percent. Um, we go out into the market and we get from several different um, uh, exchanges, we get the current price for a particular asset. So we don't pad the actual spot price. So a lot of mm. the exchanges that do this for free, they're actually padding the spot price. There's some spread essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so we're we're trying to be more transparent about it and saying we're going to get the best rate. And then there's a half a percent in regards to the to the transaction. So that that way it's very predictable and you can kind of see what's happening um, both in the ecosystem and with your assets. That's awesome. And to be honest, to get 0.5%, on a fiat to crypto exchange in either direction, that's a huge feat. I, I know that again, because either, as you mentioned, you have to go through a whole suite of providers who I actually had no idea had this limitation, you know, in this process where you really can't move that capital so smoothly, but you guys have been able to do this in a compliant manner and keep those costs low. So I think that that's, that's really exciting, Ken. And I know it's not easy to go through that process of getting the money license and building everything from the ground up, but to be able to maintain a cost structure where 0.5% works, that's awesome. But I, I wanted to go ahead. Oh yeah, sorry. No, I mean, it, 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 it what it points to is the the ridiculous sort of price abuse that yeah. these on ramp and off ramps have been have been doing. I mean, they're earning massive amounts of revenue off of these things, as opposed to trying to facilitate earn a revenue, of course, but trying to facilitate the market and the ability for the market to sort of expand, expand. and move. Um, they've taken this approach of sort of price gouging because they're they're sort of the bottleneck in the entire system. And so we're trying to facilitate economic activity. That's our priority in the short term to, you know, massive profits. Yeah. So that's really huge that you guys have focused on this on-ramp and borrowing lending functionality. I think that's kind of the first killer application within the Mel ecosystem as a whole. But as we kind of were unpacking a bit earlier, Meld is more than just one particular product or technology suite. You have a whole range of different applications or parts that kind of meet towards this goal. So I wanted to kind of give the stage to you, Ken, then maybe I'll, I'll dive in with some follow-up questions. 
the Meld blockchain, you've got Meld Finance and Meld DAP, which are technically separate applications, but eventually might migrate into kind of being the similar product that offers support for fiat currencies, um, all your tokens and NFTs, cross-chain bridging, staking, swapping, all the kind of stuff that people are used to. So people who are used to the Ethereum, you know, EVM compatible networks like Avalanche or Ethereum or use as well to maybe Cardano as well. And then we've got some people from our channel watching Card um, from the Cardano ecosystem, all can participate within Meld through this bridging mechanism. So I'm curious to kind of get the top down view from your perspective as a founder. What, how does it all work together and what does it look like? So the, the, there's two basic ideas that we started with. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is that non-custodial is the way to go custod custodial is super risky uh, you shouldn't trust other people with your assets um mm -hmm. that idea has been proven now with you know blockfi and celsius and ftx yeah. and, you know this whole laundry list of failures on the on the custodial side with prime trust being the latest um that's the first part and then the second part is this idea that you need to be able to control your own assets and generate a liquidity you need to be able to get mm -hmm. liquidity out of the system so we wanted to have these two basic principles and then take the idea forward so that we could put it into the into the market and so that's kind of where the 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 big picture comes from is we want to be able to be non-custodial and we want people to be liquid and be able to handle their own assets mm -hmm. So to get anywhere in and out of the ecosystem fluently so people have that trust. I think, again, as you mentioned, if you have the ability to get out of the ecosystem as easily as you can get in, I think that's where you start building long-term trust. And I think that's probably one of the biggest friction points that institutions have had. And even as of recent, it's felt like that, like you step into the industry and you just don't know if the partner tool you're using or the wallet or staking platform you're using is trustworthy in that case. So you guys are doing everything from a non-custodial point, you know, whether it be from- As much as contracts. possible. Yeah, yeah, as much as possible, yeah. So we have, so that's also goes back to sort of the blockchain side. We want to make sure that things are very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started on Cardano and we're still on Cardano, but we're expanding out into the EVM world. And as part of that, we have launched our own layer one blockchain. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is two things. One, we wanted to make sure that we could have an extremely low transaction fee. So the mm -hmm. transaction fees right now are at about 0.00013 cents for a transaction. Wow. So they're super, super cheap, right? And almost blockchains start that way with very, very cheap. Ethereum used to have cheap transactions. Yeah. But as the token goes up in value, then that, that sort of cheap gas gets very, very expensive. And so the way we designed our system was meld uh, the token is trading at about two cents right now. When it gets to $20, then a basic transaction on the meld blockchain should cost one cent. That's the idea. I'm not saying that meld will ever get to $20. It would be fantastic. Right. But you guys have kind of meant a lot of it. But that's kind of the idea is what happens if everything goes so amazingly perfect that we get to $20. It's like what? a hundred thousand percent increase and we still need it to be a cheap transaction but the challenge you have is when you do this when you structure things like this you have to pay validators for block rewards it's a proof of stake blockchain so everybody that's validating the network needs to earn enough money in order to be able to run their systems right that's the basic principle that's why gas is so expensive on ethereum mm -hmm. because the gas goes to pay for the infrastructure so we decided to kind of turn it on its head and say that not the transaction fees, but the actual revenue from the lending and borrowing protocol goes to pay the block. The validators. That's interesting. So essentially, like, uh, again, I don't want to make a direct comparison, but how there's MakerDAO on Ethereum. And essentially, there's the yield that's paid out, like essentially on different types of loans. You guys are doing that on an integrated protocol level, like where essentially the stakers and the network are getting they're getting benefit from providing the infrastructure as this network continues to grow over time. It's, it's a great example. So yeah. imagine, if, imagine if all of the revenue, all of the profit from Maker went to pay block rewards or meant to pay for all the gas fees on Ethereum. And then Ethereum mm -hmm. gas was super, super, super cheap. One, people would use a lot more dye. And two, there would be just this explosion of economic activity on the Ethereum blockchain because gas was so much cheaper. 
And so it, the thesis is correct. Economic activity should equal benefits for the validators. But we just decided to say that that, that economic activity is not the transaction, but it's the, the revenue from the lending and borrowing. The transactions stay cheap, which sort of they, they, they push more adoption, they push more usage of the blockchain. Yeah. So instead of like kind of taxing throughput on the network, you guys are essentially kind of the network gets stronger. It has more resiliency on its validators when there's more real activity going on right. when that core, with that core function. And I think, again, that's important. Like, again, I think swapping, you know, which is, again, something people could do on meld and stuff. There will be those typical kind of DeFi applications on chain. And also you guys will, again, through meld finance, offer swapping services, you know, and from crypto to fiat. But I think, again, people really misunderestimate that if we want DeFi to really be this, you know, pie in the sky figure of a trillion dollars or multiple trillions in the long term over like a decade long period of growth, the only way we're going to do this is by allowing for credit facilitation and for people to, again, see digital assets, I think, is this kind of new form of, of collateral, is this new form of assets that you can essentially create credit from and hmm. drive economic activity, both in crypto, but also externally in the world as well. And that's kind of that's that's probably the most interesting part of all of these systems. It's great that we're we're able to sort of make this fiat to crypto sort of uh, movement very fluid. But the interesting part is that the in a lending and borrowing protocol, um, it's not really it, it doesn't you can't really you shouldn't really call it a lending and borrowing protocol because effectively mm -hmm. a lot of people don't do lending and borrowing with a lending and borrowing protocol they just simply supply an asset and then they generate a yield and they're just yeah. that's all nothing else so it's it's more similar to a savings account or a cd or something along those lines than it is to lending and borrowing you can supply all of your assets get no risk exposure right you're not borrowing anything you're not going to yeah. get liquidated um, and you generate a yield and you're sort of participating in the in the ecosystem. And then if and when necessary, you can borrow against that. So it's not like a traditional loan in the sense that, you know, when you yeah, go the to person the bank, could default, loans, you know, yeah, and you could essentially, yeah. Yeah, you could go and you say, I have this collateral. Here you go. Now give me money. That's not the way that it works. It says, I have this collateral. I want to earn a bunch of money from it here. Maybe in the future, I have the option on my discretion to be able to borrow against it. And that's the sort of second big part is that in a bank, you're one of three actors. So the bank is the one that is actually using your collateral and making money from it. They're earning interest off of you because you're they're giving you a loan. And then when, when and if it defaults or they liquidate, then they earn from that as well. And so in a DeFi protocol like Mel or like Aave, um, the users benefit from all three sides. So the users supply the asset, the users borrow against other assets, and the users do the liquidation. So the roles are different. So in a bank, they're incentivized to take as much money from you as possible. No. In the case of MELD, uh, we're incentivized to create as much harmony between all three parties as is possible. So we want to create as harmonious a system so that everybody benefits rather than try and sort of gouge one of the actors involved. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, so you guys have this kind of core focus or thesis around, again, I, I think you're right about not really calling it lending and borrowing and stuff, but essentially this focus of having a credit system within the crypto space, which I think, again, is a huge use case brought long term for the crypto sector. But I'm curious, uh, you know, like outside of this, well, Ken, like you guys also will have like swapping features as well. So I'm assuming because you guys are EVM compatible, people can do just to kind of give people the context for it who may not know, like you guys will be able to do essentially everything that you can do on like the Avalanche as you guys are a subnet from Avalanche uh, with the Mel blockchain um, and anything you could do on, say, Ethereum. Right. So you have ERC-20 token equivalents smart contract deployments. So the applications that so many are familiar with already could be deployed on meld with much higher throughput and scalability, lower transaction costs, and be able to do much more complex things. Correct. And, and we see blockchains as not application layers. We see them as liquidity. Mm -hmm. So in the, we have a, we have a, a wallet um, that currently connects to the meld blockchain, the Cardano blockchain, Ethereum, and Avalanche. We're going to be adding Moonbeam, Bitcoin, Polygon, and BNB soon. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you look at these different blockchains as kind of different stock markets. You look at them as the ability to move your assets 
between the, these different blockchains as liquidity pools. And when you bring mm -hmm. your assets, you bring your assets to the meld blockchain and you borrow against them as a group, as opposed to what you do currently on Aave, where you have to log into Aave and Avalanche and do something there, and then look over here and log into Aave and Polygon and do something there. And then right. everything gets super fragmented, right? It's developed by engineers. And so it's it's technically it's great, but it just the user experience is really bad. Yeah. And so our focus is to clean that up. Yeah. Everything really, that's the problem with even though you have bridging, everything is kind of siloed. And essentially you're having to manage things across multiple different chains. Whereas in this case, Meld is kind of this one central place where a lot of that liquidity can flow to as a central part for creating credit in the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and we, we, you know, we're not doing the bridging. We're working with bridging partners. Right. Um, so it's not like, it's not like we're trying to centralize anything. So we have, we have partners for a lot of these different activities. When you do swapping, it goes out to several, it goes, does DEX routing and you get the best rates and, you know, this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And Very cool. the point is that it's the user experience. And, you know, as you know, and lots of people, if you bridge your assets, really, there's a lot of anxiety involved in it. You have to connect to this DAP and then you have to go find this address and you see if this <laughs> is correct. And, you know, am I sending the right asset to the right place? And, you know, it, it's a really, it's a really hard, it's a really stressful process. We want, we think that that process should be trivial. It should be very, very simple. You simply select the asset in the blockchain, select the asset in the blockchain, set and forget. Um, and that's what's happening in the background. But for some reason, the way it works today in the foreground, because you're connecting to all these different dApps, it becomes really uh, disconnected and siloed. Yeah, it's been really poured onto the user that you have to take on this responsibility. And I, I mean, it's no wonder why we've seen such a stagnation in, in DeFi over these last couple of years. Uh, you know, I know, Ken, you, you've been, uh, I remember I was reading up, you've been kind of in DeFi for a long period of time, uh, myself included. For me, I think it's the killer application here in crypto. And you know, some people talk about NFTs and other things like that, but I think that's kind of an umbrella or one of the items under the umbrella of DeFi as this, this potential use case for crypto beyond being some store of value asset class. And I think, again, it's a, it's a match made in heaven because we're now treating this digital liquidity, you know, whether it be Ethereum, whether it be Mel, with all these assets as potential backbones in order to create credit and uh, decentralized stable coins, essentially, um, or tap into other forms of liquidity. I wanted to talk, though, a little bit about Meld, though, because you yeah. guys do have like a native protocol token. So my understanding is that Meld is like your typical kind of um, for the blockchain itself, it is the typical form of kind of utility, governance, everything that you can kind of ask it into a normal token. It's used for transaction fees. Uh, people as well can use it as a form of payment. So it, generally speaking, it's kind of the native protocol token for that core uh, ecosystem. But is it also used elsewhere outside of, uh, you know, particularly the Mel blockchain uh, in the sense of like the applications, like Mel Finance? Yeah, so so it's a it's a native cross chain asset. So we mm -hmm. deploy all of the smart contracts on all of the different blockchains, um, both on uh, on Cardano and all of the other EVMs. So the asset is intended to be kind of omnipresent um, across all blockchains. So we don't have the concept of wrapping of Meld. It's just yes. Meld on Ethereum. It's like USDC or USDT, right? It's just you don't have WUSDC. You just have USDC, and it sort of works everywhere that's the idea behind it um it's a little bit different on the meld blockchain because we the the concept of gas is is it's going to run its course um and it's already we already see it now um uh, this this idea of meta transactions the ability to use other right. things to yeah. pay for gas pay for transactions this is what we are because we're building our own blockchain we're kind of building the kind of perfect blockchain um, we've implemented meta transactions. So if anybody builds on the Mel blockchain, they can implement this and you can either use other tokens for transactions, but more interestingly, we have the ability for uh, gas subscriptions. So you mm -hmm. can subscribe and pay X amount per month and then never think about gas again. Yeah. Just, just, just to explain a really super cool idea. Yeah, no, I think that that's a great point, Ken. Just to, to further clarify for those who are listening and hearing about it for the first time, meta transactions are a really cool concept because, as Ken rightfully pointed out, you know the, the huge user friction point is, let's say you build a really cool application on Meld. Let's say we, we build, for example, Meld Finance competitor, right? And I want to build some kind of nice neobank application uh, crypto wallet. 
the problem is that if people want to do transactions, usually if it was to function like Ethereum, you're going to need ETH or MELD in your wallet essentially to pay for gas fees, whatever the native protocol gas token is. But now uh, letting the protocol application or some other kind of party be able to pay that and you have maybe a much more simpler interface like not having to pay gas or as you said, maybe paying like a dollar each month or something or whatever might be a reasonable price it's so much more familiar for people like, you know, some kind of subscription or low cost model rather than having to buy some token that may go up or down. And, you know, it just for yeah. users, it, it just seems so like foreign for the broader, uh, you know, user base, but we forget that in crypto, you know, that that's not the typical kind of web to experience. So I think that's awesome. You guys are going to have support for meta transactions. Uh, yeah. So this, these types of things are what we're trying to do for this kind of, for the next generation, this idea that, you know, Blockchains are liquidity. Gas is something that should be going, should be sort of behind the scenes, not in the front. The idea of, of uh, account abstraction, which is going to come next year, where you can have like smart wallets and things like that. Mm. These are the ideas that are kind of more important. But first, you have to build the basics. You know, you have to build the fiat control. You have to build the the lending and borrowing. You have to build the transactions. That's kind of where we stand right now. Yeah. On that point, Ken, I wanted to talk about there is a, an airdrop going on, guys, for MELD as a token. So I highly recommend you guys check that out. But uh, I'll leave a link down below in the description for details on that. But on that point, Ken, you know, as you guys are kind of really kind of getting out there now, the protocol itself and all the applications around it, you guys are going to kind of early access for MELD finance uh, as an application tool. I'm curious, like, what are uh, some ways that people can learn more about what you guys are doing and get more involved within both the protocol, but also in the entire ecosystem as a whole? Yeah, I mean, one way is through the through the airdrop. So mm -hmm. if you decide to participate in the airdrop, um, the first step in that is to get uh, apply for early access for the Neobank. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, any sort of on-chain activity that you do will count towards your airdrop. Um, social activities that you do. We have, if you go to the website, you'll see there's a whole bunch of different things you can do for, for social activities. All of those will count towards the airdrop. And so then once we do the airdrop, then you'll be able to sort of um, benefit from this process. So we wanted to do the airdrop largely as a kind of awareness campaign um, to sort of get people to know that there is this alternative. You know, a lot of our competitors have gone out of business in the past year and a half, right? Yeah. So there's not a lot of people offering this now. You know, you had, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, you had Signature. You know, a lot of the crypto banks are leaving or going or they won't work with normal people. And so we just need to get awareness out there that there is a proper crypto neo bank that sort of takes this stuff seriously on both sides and makes it easy and doesn't try to take advantage and get that word out to as many people as possible awesome and i think and it's it's the perfect application and broader concept to get the next wave of people into crypto um, again from one founder to another I, I wish you guys all the best in this i think the vision is solid you guys have a good roadmap you understand the importance of credit and this kind of, again, lending borrowing mechanism in the crypto space using crypto assets as kind of digital collateral and uh, really opening up a whole range of value for a whole new audience that hasn't even stepped into the space yet. So I'm really excited to see how it plays out. I'll leave a links down below in the description, guys, not only to the drop, but also towards a whole range of different resources for what Ken and the team are building at Meld. But Ken, thank you, man, for making the time. It was a pleasure to get to chat with you. And uh, we'll have to have you back on the channel again in the future, man. Super. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate it.